<laughs> All right, our timer hasn't started yet, but... Oh, there we go. Okay. We're good to go. Um, thanks for being here. I am Frédéric Lardinois. I'm the enterprise editor for TechCrunch, and with me today is Nathan from GraphCore, who you probably saw yesterday, but why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Nathan Harper. I'm a member of the uh, cloud development team at GraphCore, and I've been working on integrating uh, our hardware products into OpenStack for about the last two years at this point. And for those who weren't there yesterday, what does GraphCore do? Um, so GraphCore, we, are, we have uh, developed our own uh, silicon um, systems, software, SDKs, um, all of which have been designed for AI machine learning from the ground up. And what does it look like in practice? You know, what can I do right now on, on GraphCore? So, uh, so right now we have our, your, our systems are our IPU machines. So one of our IPU machines is, um, it looks like a server, uh, but you can't use it like a server, you, there's, you, you, you can't log on to it, it's, it's effectively a network appliance um, containing, four of our, uh, containing four of our IPUs. So then a user will then access that over the network. We'll try and obfuscate as much of that as possible, users don't need to, don't need to use it. But from a, from a practical user point of view, we have been pushing very hard to try and make sure that our SDKs and frameworks are as well supported as what you would see on other AI accelerators. And um, so if you use PyTorch, you can use PyTorch on, on IPU. If you use TensorFlow, you can use TensorFlow on IPU. Um, and if there's anything that doesn't work, these are things that we're interested in finding out about so that we can you know, uh, enhance that. We are, we've been planning ahead for our next release of our SDK, and the intention is at that stage is that everything should be one-to-one. Uh, you know, -one. So if you have a, a model that has been trained and run on GPUs, you should be able to pick up that same, or you're in PyTorch, for example, you should be able to take that same thing and run it on IPUs without having to make any code changes. So you're basically the NVIDIA of OpenStack. So. <laughs> I, I, it's, you know, I, it's, there's, there's no point kind of trying to... Uh, I, I like to think of us as, you know, we, we sit on our own space. Fair enough. <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say something like that. Now, you made this bet on OpenStack pretty early for your infrastructure, right? Can you talk a little bit about the journey and why you ended up using OpenStack? Yeah. So we had, um, you know, as, as one of the things I mentioned in the keynote yesterday, is our reference systems, you know, we have our, our pod 64 systems, you get uh, some application servers, some IPU machines, and the networking that connects it all together. And the reference design for that was very static. You know, all of these things, all the, all the systems were in, would be in a single VLAN for that pod. Each pod would then be uh, you know, uh, entirely separate from all the others. And then most of the time that, that would be Fine, you know it works. It would it, you'd absolutely hit all the performance that you'd expect. Um, but the challenge came around. Uh, it was actually what the developers required. So um, if they needed something uh, different, so an alternative operating system, if they wanted different packages, and but crucially, it was if they wanted something different to what their colleagues who were also using the same machine or the same pod had. That was where you know, we'd end up with users crashing into each other because they were both trying to do different things with the same hardware at the same time. So um, what we, we had this real drive to how do we you know, and, and enable our developers, give them access to self-service, um, and also be able to prevent you know, the, the you know, users without any maliciousness from affecting each other by you know, changing the config of a system or you know, using the IPUs that weren't necessarily allocated to them at any, at any time. So um, when we started using OpenStack, it allowed us to be able to automatically carve up those systems in a way that we, you know, we weren't really able to do before. Well, we could do that before, but it would all be driven by hand and you know, would require your know, administrators to go in and log into switches and switch VLANs and manage which VLANs are associated with what. What we've gotten out of our, the, you know, the solution that we have in OpenStack now is that users don't need to know what VLAN they are on. OpenStack and Neutron deals with that for them. Does the user actually ever see OpenStack? 
It depends on our users. Okay. Um, so um, you know, for a lot of our users, they use the Azimuth self-serve interface, and um, because that abstracts them away from all the complicated questions that they don't need to worry about. It's um, you know, so they don't uh, you know things like they don't need to worry about is their network a VXLAN or a VLAN? Have they turned on the right features on their neutron ports to make this work? So I'd say. A good 80% of our users are using, um, you know, are, they're consuming OpenStack, but through Azimuth, so they don't have to look at it directly. The other 20% is um, either the, the, the slightly more power users, so those who actually want to drive, uh, you know, drive Terraform, drive, uh, you know, the OpenStack CLI, actively, you know, make active use of the, the API. Um, and then the, the last chunk is, is actually the system-to-system uh, -system comms. So one of the use cases we've got is for uh, managing CI runners. So um, you know, the, we get systems provisioned, connected to IPUs, run a CI job, and then get torn down uh, so that every single CI run gets a fresh instance. We don't get any kind of crossover. There's no cruft being left behind. And this is one of the, one of the, one of the drivers in that particular case is if you've got um, your partners, be it you know, kind of trusted or not, or if you're taking uh, your pull request from external parties, running the, um, running the CI on that, you're effectively inviting code that has been written by someone else to be executed on your infrastructure. So um, absolutely having a fresh deployment every single time means that you know, any, any malicious or not things that have been left behind. Um, well, those IPUs make for good crypto miners, maybe? <laughs> well, yeah, I, these, are the, you know, these, are, these are problems that a lot of uh, you know, uh, service providers have run into, you know, where it's like, even if, it, you know, sadly, you know, even if uh, people aren't using the IPUs, you know, if you've got some you know, nice, juicy AMD CPUs, people will always find a way to uh, run miners on them. Hey, there you go. Um, that's, that's my business plan when I'm done here. <laughs> but um, what does the scale look like for you right now? Like, how many clouds are we talking about? How many servers? So at this point, we've got, um, we've got five clouds um, of varying sizes. Um, the largest ones at this point are, I think, about 12,000 cores a piece um, with hundreds of IPU machines uh, associated with them. Um, rather than deploying one large system in kind of multi-region, generally they've been deployed for different purposes. So we have internal systems made available to our developers. We have an external system um, so that we can make systems available to customers on a kind of try before you buy um, approach. Um, we have another system that we're currently bringing up at the moment, which is going to be focused much more on bare metal deployments. And um, you, uh, you know, so you know, we've, we've just got a lot of flexibility. We've just decided, you know, rather than trying to make one cloud do everything for us, you know, let's build a system that has been focused. And that way, we don't have to worry about geographic complexity as well. Makes sense. And maybe just to take a step back there, what's, what's really different about AI workloads compared to some other workloads? And kind of where does OpenStack fit in there? So AI work, or there's, there's probably a difference between AI workloads that most people encounter and AI workloads in graph core land. Mm -hmm. So for, for a lot of you know, users using AI workloads, it is very much about access to GPUs. And so those GPUs will generally be directly attached to your VMs or your bare metal systems. Um, so that will drive a very particular sort of workload. Because of our disaggregated approach, uh, there is much more of the you know, slightly more traditional high-performance computing element to it. So um, because we, we are, our IPU over fabric protocol uses RDMA over converged ethernet, um, actually the performance of the networking and so being able to do line rate RDMA inside OpenStack is, is vital to making our, our systems work. Got it, got it. And to make all of that work, I think you also had to write your own ironic drivers, right? So, uh, so it's, at the moment, we are carrying a, um, a, you know, a patched version of Ironic, um, or you know, particularly of the um, uh, to drive our IPU machines. Um, the intention is, is we're going to be uh, you know, 
ensuring that that gets made, you know, made available upstream. And so, I mean, we had a, it's the nice thing about being here at Open Infra is you get to actually talk to people face to face about some of these things. And, um, you know, we had the opportunity to, to talk to some of the ironic team about why we were doing what we were doing. And their response was like, that's a great use case. You know, let's try and make it so. So. Is that actually, do you do a lot of, do you open source a lot of what you're working on? So, uh, in terms of, in terms of the open stack side of things, we've got reference architectures for how we've been doing things. Um, we, th there hasn't been an enormous amount of specific custom, uh, your custom code. It's just about, you know, here are some of our, your know, best working recipes for how to make, uh, you know, how to make Nova, you know, fly. You know, how do we, how do we make our VMs achieve the same sort of performance that we get out of bare metal? Um, one of the things, uh, so you know, uh, when in, the, in, in our keynote yesterday, John talked about when we were running MLPerf, that was our benchmark, and that was you know, what we were using to basically ensure that we actually got best, you know, the, achieved the kind of performance that we wanted. Um, there were some firmware, uh, uh, your know, BIOS settings, that actually once we'd applied those, we, we were actually able to get better performance out of our VMs than we were out of our reference bare metal systems at the time. Admittedly, when we then took those settings and applied them to the bare metal, the bare metal then also got faster. But it's just the, the whole process that we went through in trying to drive this had a benefit for what we were doing in OpenStack, but then it had a benefit for the wider graph core that weren't using OpenStack-based systems at the time. We're talking about that. Um, you've been playing around with OpenStack for quite a while, but also some other systems before that, right? Now, if you had to go back, I think you started using OpenStack at GraphCore in 21, 2020? Uh, oh, sorry, in terms of personally, or in Gra at, at GraphCore. At GraphCore, yeah, we've been using it in, uh, since, yeah, since 2021. Well, you've been playing around with it for much longer, right? So. Yeah, I was trying to work out what, what, actually when the first OpenStack, I think it was Akata, was the first deployment that I, I Right. It goes back a while. Yeah. Now, if you had to do it all over again at GraphCore, what would you do different? So I think with the benefit of hindsight, um, there were probably a lot of uh, capabilities, features inside um, OpenStack that, for good reason, we chose not to use. You know, so for our first deployments, we were very focused on achieving your, our goal, which was to take our IP machines and put them into OpenStack and achieve a very similar capability to what we got on our bare metal systems. Um, so as a result, there was a variety of features which we chose not to turn on. Um, and so, but in hindsight, or you know, with, uh, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, now that we've achieved that, there are a lot of things that we would, uh, it would have been useful to turn on. And I, I, a notable one is you know, our very first system, we didn't deploy Octavia and which then suddenly became a bit of a headache whenever we wanted to start doing Kubernetes in that cloud because there's a Octavia, lot of- Octavia, the load balancer. Yes, yeah. And um, so yeah, it was just, uh, but at the same time, it's like, you know, that is, you know, with, with real benefit of hindsight because you, the thing we, you know, we need to also manage is when you turn, you know, you're building a new OpenStack cloud and you might, you know, the, it'd be very easy, especially when you're using, you know, something like, you know, Collar Ansible or, you know, kind of KOB, when you've just got, here are all the things, do I want to turn them on? It'd be very easy to just go, yes, enable, 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 yes, I want all the things. Um, uh, but then you might end up deploying things that you never use, or you might end up deploying things which might confuse matters, or, you know, um, or some of those, you know, some of the things, when you turn them on, they are just on. Others, once you've turned them on, there's, you know, post-configuration setup, and if you don't know exactly what you need to do, then, um, then, then it might, you might just end up, you're biting off more that you can chew um, from day one. But I, uh, so it's definitely a balancing act. How much, how much do I want to enable, um, but without making it too overly complicated? What does it look like today? Like compare your OpenStack deployments from a few years ago to what you're doing today. Uh, so the scale has definitely got bigger. Um, uh, you, so our, our very first OpenStack deployments were, they weren't static. Um, you know, they were still driven by, you know, um, driven by automation, but we would generally be turning over one of our virtual pods, you know, every couple of days. Um, today, we've now, you know, we, we get, um, I don't know, maybe about 70 V pods being deployed every day, and they get turned over every day. Um, 
looking entirely different every year, every time. So it's every day our developers get access to a fresh, you know, a fresh system that may be way larger or way smaller than the system that they had the, the previous day. Sure, and I always like to end on a bummer because we only have 10 seconds left, but <laughs> um, what's still your biggest challenge when it comes to deploying OpenStack right now? Uh, so so um, our challenge is that even, you know, uh, We've got a really nice process, a really nice template for how we're going to do things. Um, but when deploying into a new, you know, a new geography, a new data center, we run into different challenges. Um, it's a lot of it is around the networking or the networking that has been provided to us by a you know, bit by the colo or the data center provider that we're working with, and where things just look very slightly different. And it's the you know, cascading cannibal effect of um, you know oh we're just we'll, we'll deploy this it's going to be exactly the same as that last system but we're just going to change that one thing and it's the <laughs> the unintended consequences of changing that one thing and and how it goes uh, you know I've seen that before awesome well thank you so much our time is up here I'm afraid mm -hmm. these 15 minutes go fast they do indeed thank, thank you, thank you for having me thank you